Uh, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to give this uh, lecture on the seismic noise. And indeed, I am working on seismic noise since many years. And the reason why I got interested in it was that in part of my research position, uh, part of my position at, uh, at IPGP is a position where you have to work with an observatory. And I've been working since I started for the observatory of Geoscope. And for that, you need to make sure that the network is working. And one way to check that the network is working is to look at the noise spectrum because it has a characteristic shape. And because of that, I started to be interested not only checking that the instrument were working, but also understanding the sources of the noise. And that's how slowly I moved my research to work on seismic noise. And this is what I've been doing for the last, uh, for at least 10 years or even more. And I work on this topic with many people. I've been working on this topic with many people. They are mostly listed here, and there may be some that I've forgotten. And now I will present you the seismic noise on Earth and on Mars. And I will start uh, with the Earth. If you want to... If you want to study seismic noise, uh, uh, for example, these are all the stations, all the Brandman stations that you can get today or yesterday. And you see that you have uh, thousands of stations. But out of these stations, uh, I would recommend that people work mostly... Oh, when you have a choice between stations, I would recommend that people always use the permanent station. And this is a network, this is a map of a permanent network. You see that you have permanent network from different countries, uh, uh, Canada, United States, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, and probably others. And these are the location of the station. And the interest of working with this station is because they are running for many years, you have more chance that the quality is good because the site was properly selected and also because the instrumental response was very carefully checked, which all the speed students should be aware of now. So this is one example of a station. This is a station, a geoscope station in the Rodrigue Island. The entrance of the station is here. It's a natural vault. Rodrigue Island is located here. Oui. Here. Ça va être compliqué. Okay, is it better? Okay, merci. Okay, this is, the, this is the location of Rodrigue Island. This is the entrance of a vault. And this is uh, inside the vault. You have a seismometer here. And this is the box in which we have a rest. So this is the seismometer we use. It's called STS-2 seismometer from Streckhausen. And the data logger is a Contera data logger. And when you uh, record the signal, if you record one day of signal, you will record this signal. And you see that the dominant signal that you record is a period of 12 hours. And its amplitude is huge. The amplitude is plus or minus 40 centimeters. And this is the solid tide due to the moon attraction. And uh, what we are interested uh, in the rest of my talk is this variation of a signal. So all the signal below 10, well, or let's say 1,000 seconds of period. And this is the seismic signal of uh, yeah, the seismic frequency band. When you make the spectrum of a noise uh, over one day, this is what you get, this particular shape. And you have, uh, so you have a period from 0 0.1 to 10,000 seconds. And it is plotted in uh, decibel with respect to acceleration. And you see that you have a very particular shape. So the blue curve is the vertical component. And the green and the red curve are the horizontal component. And what you see is that below one second of period, the vertical component is far larger than the horizontal component. Then between one and 20 seconds, the, the, the three components have similar amplitude. And then above 20 seconds, the vertical component is far below the two horizontal components. And this shape of the noise is similar everywhere. Here you have an example of uh, uh, this spectra for all the geoscope stations. You see they all have the same shape. And because of that, this is how we check when the how good are the stations. So every station should record a signal when there's no earthquake that is between these two lines because this is the low noise model, this is the high noise model, 
And these curves were made by using uh, many, many stations and plotting all of them together. And we could see that they were, depending on the quality, they were closer or less close to the low noise model, but they are in between these two bands. And if they are not, there's a problem with the station. Just one second. So for the rest of my talk, I will mostly talk about the vertical component. So this is again the same spectrum. And before you want to analyze the source, you need to make sure that what you are going to analyze is indeed the seismic noise coming from the ground. And one important thing is to check how the station was installed. This is one station in Martinique. This is the entrance of the vault of the station. This is the same spectrum. And you can clearly, and here is a spectrogram. This is the beginning of the year. This is the end of the year. You retrieve this peak here. And what you see is that uh, during this period of the year, the noise level was far uh, higher than after. And the difference between the two is up to 20 dB, which is a lot. And the reason for that was just that at some point, we decided to change the insulation of the station. And uh, after... Uh, this date, uh, we have put the station on a graveyard stone, then we have put cotton around it, then we have put a cooking pot that is sealed to the, to the ground and in which we could put vacuum, then aluminium foil, then styrofoam on top of it, and then again aluminium foil. And by doing this, we were decreasing a lot the thermal and the pressure insulation, and it changed a lot the amplitude of the noise. So, the first thing to make sure is that what you are recording is indeed uh, uh, not uh, a problem of insulation of a station. So now we start with a short pen on noise. So as I come from the long period community, uh, short period for me is between 0 0.1 to 1 second. And I know that with respect to many of you, this is very high period, a uh, very uh, high uh, this is not short period, okay. Uh, so if we start with the signal that we have below one second, we have ex here an example of two, sp two spectrogram over one year, and uh, the period band of interest here is between 0 0.1 and one second of period. And it is not clear on this slide, it's better on my screen, but I made it a little clear here. When you are in France, you have a minimum of noise every Sunday. You may see it better like this. When you are in Algeria, you have a minimum of noise every Friday. So this is a quick way to check the religion of the country. And it, this has been very popular over the last period because this is a plot by uh, Thomas Lecoq with many others. And they, they retrieve the minimum of noise every Sundays. But what they showed is that during the lockdown, the noise level was as low as on Sundays, but uh, during the entire period of the lockdown. And there are many studies that can be done using this type of data because we have access to a signal that we could not get before. So then we go to the next band, between one second and 300 seconds of period. And the reason why I've put them together is that all this signal is generated in the ocean, but because the shape is very different, the mechanisms are also very different. And one thing important to remember is that if you look at the highest amplitude you can reach, which is minus 100 dB, and the lowest one, about minus 180, it means that you record uh, ground acceleration going from 10 to the power minus 5 to 10 to the power minus nine, which is a huge variability of the amplitude of the noise. So in this, no, in this you can separate the secondary micro season, and this is the signal between one and 10 seconds. So this signal here, then the primary micro season, it is this small band here. And finally, the hum, which is why you have the lowest level of the noise. And I told you that all this signal is generated in the ocean. And uh, uh, you can clearly see it because if you look at this shape here, this is the same shape as uh, ocean wave spectrum. You see like this? 
And this ocean wave spectrum has a gentle slope here, because this corresponds to the wind sea. You, you can have wind sea of different size. And then you have uh, the highest altitude that you have is the swell. In that case, you have two peaks because you have two swell arriving at one place, coming from any direction. And then you have a steep slope here. And the reason of this steep slope is that you cannot have, uh, you can have, have uh, storms in the ocean larger than a given size. So you have storms of every size coming from here to here, and then you have a cutoff because you cannot have much larger uh, storms. And uh, there are another type of wave which are called the infragravity waves, which are also important for us. And uh, what was shown was that the infragravity waves are the source of the hum, this signal here, and the wind sea and the swell are the source of a secondary microseism and of a primary microseism. And in the, yeah, yeah, in, the, in the rest of my talk, I will mostly, oh, of this part, I will mostly talk of a, about the secondary microseism. And it was shown in the 50s, 1950s, that the secondary microseism are generated by ocean waves coming from opposite direction, one from here and one from here. And when they meet, they create a second order pressure fluctuation term, which we call here P2. And the characteristic of it is that the frequency of this pressure term is the double of the frequency of the ocean waves. So that the PhD student from Quest, uh, uh, from Spin, uh, are well aware of it. We went last week to the beach with them, and here they are. And they could count the period of the waves coming here. And, what they, and we checked it also yesterday. And uh, what we could see is that the period of the waves is about uh, 12 seconds. And this is indeed the double of the period that we have for the peak of the secondary microseism. Then if we look at how this secondary microseism vary with time, here is an example where you have, uh, look only at each uh, top uh, figure. The top one is a station in continent, it's a station in France, a massive central, and here you have many years. And you see that this noise is high in amplitude and uh, as, uh, uh, okay, goes to high amplitude, up to 10 seconds of period, and it has a, no, sorry, high period and also high amplitude, and this is when it is winter. So every winter you have a longer period and higher amplitude, and it repeats all over the year. If you are in a station in an island, you see that the noise level is much bigger than a continental station, and you have still some variability, but less. The fact that the island station has more noise is, of course, because they are closer to the source, which are in the ocean. And there's one particular case, it is Antarctica. In Antarctica, you have high noise during summer, and you have a cutoff of the noise in winter, and this repeats every year. And at the beginning, we thought that there was something wrong with the station, but indeed, it is correct. And this is a zoom in Antarctica, where you retrieve high noise when it is summer and low noise when it is winter. And the reason for that is that in winter, you have sea... This is the location of the station. It's the station DRV. It is located here. And when it is winter, we have sea ice contour here. And it means that we cannot have ocean wave crossing and we cannot have sources of ocean waves close to the station. When it is summer, the contour of sea ice is in red here, and then you can have many more sources in that location. And that's why in Antarctica, we have more noise when it is summer than when it is winter. And this is a measure that is very precise, because here you have an example. Let's look only at the top figure. Here is a spectrogram of one year, and... Uh, you can see here, suddenly you had an increase of noise where, where you have the arrow. And in this figure, it's the amount of ice perpendicular to the coast that is along this line. So the station is located here. And what we see is that uh, uh, the ice was melting that particular days. And as soon as there were less ice, we had an increase of noise. And then it was freezing again, and then the amplitude of the noise st uh, started to be bigger again. Okay, now I will show you just a few slides about the theory. 
And the purpose of showing you this is so that you understand why the secondary macrocism has the double of the frequency of the primary macrocism. And there are two key papers for understanding it. One is by Longe Higgins, he was written in 1950, and the second one by Hasselman, who was, who was written in 1963. And I would like to make you notice that Carl Hasselman is the person who got the Nobel Prize last year, but not because of this beautiful paper on microseism, but more for his work on oceanography. And uh, uh, this, this work was done by Longe Higgins when he was PhD student. And I'm really impressed. Uh, so, to start, we have to understand what kind of motion you can have in the, in the ocean. And uh, when the ocean is compressible, you will have at the top the ocean gravity waves, which are the waves that you see at the coast. And these ocean gravity waves decrease after a given depth. And then below, you have only compression wave, which in seismology we call acoustic or P waves. So, Longe Higgins uh, showed how to compute uh, the pressure fluctuation uh, inside the ocean. And for that, uh, he showed that we need to develop every equation up to the second order. So he considered the sea surface elevation, which is called eta, developed to the second order. And we need the fluid uh, particle velocity, which is called u. Be careful, in seismology, U is often the displacement. Here it's the velocity. And we consider that the fluid is incompressible, so we have this expression. And then to describe the particle motion in the fluid, we, uh, we use the Euler equation, in which we need also to introduce the density and the pressure force and the gravity force. And with this, we have all the ingredients for computing everything. So... If we start at first order, we consider that there's no motion in the fluid. So u is equal to u0 is equal to 0. And we have no uh, sea surface elevation. So that means we have no waves. So eta is equal to 0. And we want to compute the, the pressure inside the, flu um, inside the fluid at uh, the zero order. So the Euler equation becomes this. And we can we get just the hydrostatic equilibrium, that is the pressure will depend on the surface pressure and the and the rouge Z. That means it will increase with depth because of the weight of the, of the water. Then if we go to first order, same equation, now we develop the pressure, the velocity of the fluid and the sea surface elevation to first order, we get these three terms. And the equation of motion becomes like this. And then we introduce a further hypothesis, which is that the fluid is irrotational, we say. There's no rotation of the motion. And then we can write the velocity as a gradient of a potential. And we, this is what we do here. And then the velocity of the fluid will have two terms. One, horizontal motion, which is just the horizontal uh, derivative of the potential, and one, vert one uh, vertical motion, which is the vertical derivative of the potential. And uh, if we take uh, the Euler equation, all the boundary condition, we can search a solution that will be on that form. For the sea surface elev elevation, it will be an amplitude with an oscillating motion like this. And for the potential, it will be uh, amplitude term that will depend on depth and a cosinus term that is like this. And uh, the reason why here it does not depend on depth is because, of course, it is at the surface. And if you solve this equation, we, we, you will find the very well known and very useful relation of dispersion for the ocean waves, which relate the uh, angular frequency to the gravity to the wave number of these ocean waves with an hyperbolic tangent term. And when we are in deep water, when the thickness of the ocean is, uh, is very big, uh, these terms comes to one, and this is the dispersion relation that you get. You can compute the potential, and finally, you can get the horizontal displacement of ocean waves and the vertical displacement of ocean waves. And these are the, the, wave, the equation that we are interested in, because you see that 
this defined a uh, circular uh, motion like this. So you have circular polarization of this signal. And uh, what we have is that the amplitude of this, the radius of this circle are decreasing with depth. So this is a behavior that everybody knows. When you dive beneath, beneath, de beneath waves at a given depth, there is no more motion. So at this order, if there is no more motion below a given depth, we cannot have microseism because we know that the microseism are waves that propagate much deeper. So that's why Longegis had the clever idea to develop the equation up to the second order. And uh, I will not detail the computation, which is not so complicated to do, but a little long. And at the end, he found this, form this fantastic equation that shows you that the second order pressure fluctuation inside the fluid now does not depend anymore on the depth, but it, okay, sorry, I forgot to say, you integrate over one wavelength, but it only depends on the temporal variation of the ocean waves. So with this equation, now we have a signal, we, ha we have something that can propagate deeper in the ocean. And if we look uh, what it means, so, uh, if you consider that at the, ocean, at the surface of the ocean, you have two waves coming from opposite direction, we can compute, we can write the wave like this. So we have one amplitude, a cosinus going in one direction, so you have a minus here. And you have a second wave uh, coming in the other direction, so you have a plus here. And then these two come from two directions. And you put this sea surface elevation into this equation, and when you make a computation, you end up with this, that is the pressure fluctuation will have this expression. And now you see that you have a factor two, so it is the double of the frequency of the ocean waves. If you have uh, only one wave coming, traveling, you have a uh, the amplitude of uh, one of the two waves will be equal to zero. And then you see that in this expression, you will not have any P2 term. It will be equal to zero. So that's why one wave propagating in the ocean does not create the secondary microseism. But if you have two waves coming from opposite direction, this is a case where they have the same amplitude, but they do not need to have the same amplitude. In that case, we retrieve this term, and indeed, we finally have the amplitude of a pressure fluctuation, that is the double of the amplitude of the ocean waves. So in the paper of Long Higgins, he made it uh, in, a, in the first part of his paper, he made it in a simple case where he considered that, the, that there were no compression in the fluid. But if there is no compression in the fluid, you cannot have acoustic wave in the fluid. So in the second part, he used the same equation and uh, he, he considered also the the compression of a fluid, the fact that the fluid is compressible, and then that you can have propagating seismic wave in it. But you can make the same computation in that case. And the way you will do the computation is that in this Euler equation, there will be some term that will dominate when you are close to the surface, and the term that will dominate will be those related to the ocean surface gravity waves. And when you are below a given depth, where we've seen that there is no more motion from a wave, you will have the acoustic wave that will dominate. And as a seismologist, what you have to remember is that the source of a second microseism will be this P2 term that we have computed. And this term is close to the surface in the shallow layers, and not, as some people write from time to time, in the entire ocean. So it, the, this term is close to the surface. And now we are done, because with this, as a seismologist, we can work, because we have this source close to the surface, and from here, we can compute the propagation of the seismic waves. So because we are in the ocean, we will have only P wave propagating, so they will go down, be reflected many times, and some of them will also propagate in the crest, and the combination of this uh, multiply reflected wave and the inhomogeneous wave or some uh, incident angle wave below will create the Rayleigh wave. So if you want to compute the seismic displacement for spectral density, you will just sum on, in the frequency domain, you will just sum on all these source uh, multiplied by the propagation term 
written in the Fourier domain, and you can compute the uh, seismic displacement power spectral density. Two things you have to remember. We have seen that the ocean waves are dispersive, and because of that, the sources will be also frequency dependent. And the second thing you have for the propagation term, you have to take into account the water depth, because uh, when you have P waves starting here, there will be amplification. For given depth as a function of frequency, you will have amplification of some uh, of some sources if you uh, you have resonance at this depth and not of others. So everything is frequency dependent here, the propagation, uh, the propagation part, and the sources. And with this, uh, you can compute uh, the amplitude of the Rayleigh waves, which are these waves, and you can also compute the amplitude of the body waves. But the body waves, even noise, are tiny signal which cannot be seen directly on the spectrogram, and they can only be observed by, uh, by doing beamforming. So now to, to, to compute the sources, we need to know where we can have this wave-wave interaction from coming from opposite direction. And there are three cases. One case is when you are within a storm, the storm is turning, you have waves coming from all directions, it is moving a little bit, and the wave generated at one time will meet the wave generated at the next time, and where they meet, it will be wave-wave interaction. The other case is when you have waves coming from one storm, they are reflected at the coast, and when you have interaction between incident wave and reflected wave, again, you have a generation, generation of, a, of a source. And finally, you can have interaction between storms. So you have one while, so this is one particular example, but the two storms can be much further away. So one source is created way, creating waves, the other one also. They can travel long distance, and when they meet, it will be the source of a secondary microseism. So this is what was computed by my colleague uh, Fabrice Ardoin, who is an oceanographer, and I will show you it now in a uh, Moving. Okay. Okay, this is what the source looks like. So the scale here is the frequency of the source from 0 0.12 to 0 0.23. It is, and every color is a frequency. And uh, uh, the time is here. And uh, you see that you have sources all the time and that the color are changing, which means that their uh, frequency content is changing. And when you have a name here, it is a typhoon or a cyclone that, that you see. And here we are in uh, February. And in February, you have mostly source, or you have large sources in the northern hemisphere. And this is what you observe. And you have also some in the Southern Hemisphere, but if you, so the film is on YouTube, even with some music made by my students, so if you want to look it for relaxing in the evening, you are welcome. And if we go to summer, now you see that you have no more sources in uh, the Northern Hemisphere, and you have most of the source in the Southern Hemisphere. So this is the signal that you need to take into account if you want to model the seismic noise. I'll stop it because it lasts quite long. Okay, and this is the address where you can find the model on YouTube. Okay, and this is what we use for modeling the Rayleigh waves in, of a secondary micro -season. So to the top here, you have a spectrogram over one year in the period band of a secondary micro -season. And to the bottom, you have a modeling. And you can see that you retrieve the strongest source when it is winter, a weaker source and shorter period when it is summer, and strongest source again when it goes again to winter. And we can see that we retrieve quite accurately the frequency content of the period, or the, up to the maximum period for the source, and also their amplitude. So we were very happy with this, but this is not, uh, but we, there's still room for improvement for it because there are two parameters which are uh, empirically determined. One is the 
seismic attenuation. And the second one is, in the ocean wave model, the amount of waves that are reflected at the coast. And this is not known by oceanographer. And for a long time, we, and, okay, and it is determined empirically, and we find, we make many modeling, and we take the reflection coefficient and the quality factor what, that fit best our data. But there's one hope, as all the, the SPIN students know, we do now DAS experiment. And uh, this is one experiment from Anthony Sladen in his book. It is a cable that is here, and that goes uh, deep in the water. And the interest for me of this cable is that part of this cable is in very shallow water. And if you're in shallow water, now you should know immediately where I want to go. So in shallow water, what you record, so this is the, this is the water depth, and this is the profile of the fiber. And what you record is this, you have time, and you have the offset, and you see things coming from this direction and coming from this direction. Okay, sorry, I cannot paint it well, but you should see it from where you are. And uh, these are the ocean waves. And what you observe from the dust is waves coming in one direction and waves coming in the other direction. So if you make a FK transform of this, you have something like this. You have a wave number and the frequency. And now you are able to measure the amplitude of a wave that go toward the land and the amplitude of the waves that go back toward the ocean. And these are the reflected waves. And if you make the ratio of the two, you can get the, uh, the reflection coefficient of the ocean waves. And we can even get its uh, variation of, uh, as a function of frequency. So currently, we're doing this kind of measurement in many different places. And if anybody has this type of data, I would be interested to know about it. Because this is what will help us to better model the, the seismic noise. I would say just one word about the body waves. The body waves are too tiny to be detected directly. So uh, the way to detect them is to do beam forming. And this is one example. So uh, this was the beam. And we detected the maximum at this location with that frequency. And when you back project it, we found out that the source was here that is in between two cyclones. So this source was generated by the interaction of these two cyclones. And uh, we were able to model it because this is the synthetic beam that we could make. And uh, this is how we, we found it um, at the same location and almost the same frequency. So this is about all what I will say about the Earth. And I, will, I, I wanted to finish my talk by um, showing you some uh, results about the noise on Mars. So to, to understand the difference, you have to remember that the radius of a planet is 3,000 kilometers, which is half the radius of the Earth. The temperature of a planet, or at least at the location of the InSight mission, is between minus 50 and minus 100, which means it is uh, much colder which means that uh, there is no liquid ocean. There is only ice. And as you are all aware, there is no ocean on Mars. And the last point important is that the atmosphere is very weak. It's only one-tenth of the French of the atmosphere in, uh, on Earth. So the station landed in Elysium Platinia in that location. And we, this area was chosen uh, because it is supposed to be flat. And, uh, but uh, from a seismological point of view, it's a very bad site because it is about as bad as the experiment we did last week. That is, it is almost as if you would put the seismometer on sand. But this is the only option we had so that we do not crash the lander. And this is an artist's view of a, of a lander. This is the lander. These are the two solar panels. This is the station here. And this is the arm that has put the seismometer from the deck down to the ground. And you see that the seismometer is covered by a protection for, for the wind. These are a few figures on the... Uh, this is the sensor when it was tested uh, uh, in the lab. And this is... Uh, so this is the seismometer. Now the seismometer in, is in this box, which, which is, uh, in which we can make vacuum to make 
to a, uh, well, to make vacuum. And this is a test of a lander. This is at the GPL lava of a lander, how to put it from the deck down to the ground. And uh, this is the station from the inside. This is the protection for the wind. And the three sensors are in here. And this is the first selfie of the station done by the arm. And this is a real picture, and I love it. And uh, this is the noise on Mars and on Earth. So the top figure are three days on Mars. On Mars, we call a day a sol, just because it's a little longer than on Earth. It is 24 hours, 40 minutes. And this is the seismic noise on Earth. This is the geoscope station Saint-Sauveur, located here. And uh, this is the one I showed you last week. And you clearly see that there's a big difference between the two. This is the solid tide. There is also a small solid tide on uh, Mars, but the dominant signal that you observe is this, that repeat every day. And if you filter it a little bit, you see it more. So you have a huge noise during the day and much less noise at night. And if you look at the wind, you have huge wind during the day and huge variable pressure variation during the day. And just because the atmosphere is, is turbulent during the day, and when we arrive at night, it, uh, the wind stops completely, as you can see here. And this explains the, uh, the, the seismic noise that we recorded on Mars. This is the same plot as what I've shown you before for the Earth, except, sorry, it is in frequency. So this is from 0 0.03 to 1 hertz. And this is the band of a, of a micro -season. So this is the peak of a secondary micro -season, the peak of a primary micro -season. And you see that, without surprise, the noise on Mars is much weaker. No, it's not a... Without surprise, we don't record the micro -season. But we were still happy to see that the noise level was very low. And you can see that the noise level can reach as small as minus 200 decibel, which is 10 to the power minus 10, which is on the order of the angstrom. So it's really, really well big. And this is the noise level that you reach during the night. And this is the noise level that you reach during the day, still far below the amplitude of the micro -season. Here you have the variability of the noise uh, over, since the beginning of the experiment. This is the first uh, sol, and this is uh, recently. And you can retrieve that you have uh, strong noise during the day. And you also see influence of a season. This is spring, this is summer, this is winter. You have noise almost all the time. And then for the next season, we, we, we had again the, this uh, variation of the noise. And this was luck because all the, the Mars quake that could be recorded were recorded when we had no wind and when we had uh, low noise and mostly in the evening. And at the end, we recorded up to 1,000 small events that are all located here, here, and here. So mostly in the evening and sometime in the morning. So from the side of our group, we were mostly interested by understanding what is the seismic noise on Mars. And uh, as we were coming from Earth study, we thought naively that we would record relay waves because relay waves are the strongest signal we record on Earth. And the relay wave can be generated, for example, by pressure uh, pushing the ground or any reason. So we did a polarization analysis. And uh, so you take the three component of a seismogram, you do the uh, S transform to convert the three component into time and frequency, and then you compute the cross spectra. And using the eigen analysis, you will have a parameter of the ellipse. So the ellipse of polarization is defined by the plane of the ellipse which is defined by the planarity vector, and the semi-major axis of the ratio of a semi-major and semi-minor axis, and also the azimuth of this ellipse. So this is what we investigated from us, and these are the results. And the, these results, so here you have an incident angle of the ellipse, so it is over one day, 24 hours, it is as a function of frequency from 0 0.1, 0 0.9 to 0 0.03, and what you see is that you have something different at 0 0.3 hertz. And uh, what we observe, and this is the incident angle of the major axis. This is the angle of a plane of ellipse, whether it is vertical or horizontal. 
And this is the azimuth of a major axis. And what we observed is that uh, at uh, high, fre uh, high frequency here, we had an ellipse that is, uh, 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 that is in the vertical plane, but the, the major axis is tilted with respect to vertical plane. It is like this. And below 0.3 hertz, we had an ellipse that is in the horizontal plane. And of course, this can not be the polarization of Rayleigh waves, so we investigated further whether here we could have Rayleigh waves. And uh, there are many other effects that can explain this polarization. And we started from the wind, which we know that is, it is very weak. And indeed, when there is wind, we, has, we have an almost one-to-one -one correlation between the noise amplitude and the wind speed. So definitely when it is a day, most of what we record is related to the wind. We even could check that uh, the azimuth of the noise particle motion, which are the black, uh, the blue uh, dots here, coincide very well with the azimuth of the wind. So clearly, during the day, this is one thing that we observe. We also inv investigated whether what we could, uh, the ellipse that we had, could be related to uh, propagating pressure fluctuation, like uh, the most famous one are dust devil, but it can be any propagation of a, of a wave front that would create an elliptical polarization. So if you compute the H over V ratio when you have um, uh, uh, this uh, fluctuation of pressure, you get an elliptical polarization. And we check that, the, and uh, this elliptical polarization will change with the uh, wind speed. Uh, and this is what was, uh, what was computed uh, uh, from the model. And then we compared the value obtained with uh, the, the aspect ratio of the ellipse, the H over V ratio, and we found that it, was, it could be similar. So this could be one explanation. But the problem is that this effect, which is called uh, tilt and compliance, does not uh, explain why the ellipse would be inclined. And up to now, the only a little exotic but possible way for explaining that the ellipse is uh, tilted would be to have uh, large eddies in high atmosphere going down as acoustic wave, and in some particular case of some angle, the polarization becomes elliptic of the waves that are propagating in the ground. And uh, in some particular case, we can have uh, an ellipse with th that is tilted by an angle of 45 degrees. But there's another problem with this model, is that if you have large eddies in the high atmosphere, it predicts also the shape of a spectrum. And the, spe say the shape of a spectrum of the, of the noise is not uh, fitting this one. So just in, uh, to conclude uh, this part, uh, so we could not find Rayleigh wave in the seismic noise. Most of the noise is, can be explained by wind activity, by tilt and compliance, and maybe by some high altitude atmospheric sources. It's only in the night during these hours that maybe we could record directly some seismic waves, but it is even not sure. But even though the dominant signal in the noise is not propagating waves, it does not mean that they are not propagating waves hidden in the noise. And for example, there have been several studies uh, of uh, autocorrelation of a signal. And there, we could find some tiny signals that are probably propagating waves. And I have just two more slides to show you. Maybe you're aware that after waiting two years, we finally have one real good big earthquake. And this is a picture of uh, this earthquake. And this is the first one that we have that may be as large as a magnitude five. And uh, this is uh, fantastic because the station is almost over because the solar panels are more and more covered by dust and soon we will have no more energy. But finally, we have one event that will change many of the results or many of the view that we have on Mars. And the first thing that changed is that now we know that we have an earthquake, a strong earthquake in Mars. So the planet still has strong earthquake and not only very tiny ones. And uh, this is another view of this earthquake. And what you see is the beautiful coda here up to a very long period. And I think I stop here. Thank you.
I think it does not differ. It's just when you have something coming with given incident angle, the reflection, co the transmission coefficient will be, will make that when you are close to the critical angle, you start to have an elliptical polarization. You could have the same on Earth, except that uh, you have so many other things that you may not observe it. Uh, yes, you, ca you can, but actually the way we, we compute the polarization is, uh, is similar to this, except that on top of that we use a phase. We did, uh, but there's no love and relay waves. Uh. Okay, uh, let's say differently. If you, if you consider the polarization, if we would uh, have uh, relay wave, you would have elliptical polarization in the vertical plane. If you would have love waves, it would be horizontally polarized, signal more linearly. Okay, and this is what we investigated, and, uh, and it was not clear that this was what we observed. Because each time we had a signal, we could explain it by the wind or by the pressure. Maybe this is the best way to answer. Is there not a question? Uh, come back to the slide of, of, of the data experiment because I had a good impression. I did have to comment. At the beginning, when you saw the, the spectrum uh, of the wave, yeah, yeah. So I have the feeling that they were more, that there is more waves going ocean warm than land warm. Can you comment on that? Yeah. <coughs> Last week when I added this figure, I agreed with you, but this is just, I don't know this, but we, we have reprocessed this data and it is not the case. But I agree that, that by looking at this, we have this impression. But I can tell you, there are more ways uh, going back, no, there are more ways going toward the coast than the opposite. But uh, I had the same impression, but okay, this is the published paper, that's what I, why I uh, put this one. Okay, by heart I would not uh, know, but uh, a few hundreds of meters. But it depends on how steep it goes. So I cannot answer like this. It's, uh, it depends on thickness as long as, long as you have waves. Yeah. But you have nice experiment in yeah. Ireland, so... Yeah. I don't... Uh... Yes? Oh, yes. For this, okay, sorry. Everything is on embargo, so I cannot tell anything. But you will see soon the answer to your question. <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay. So <clears throat> it's not fully at shallow region. It's so there. There was so, some experiment that uh, looked at it by taking a pressure sensor, and uh, it happened to be it can be one kilometer away, not exactly at the coast, but a little further away. And again, it depends on the on the thickness of the on the bathymetry where where you look at. How exactly is it generated? Is it a satellite area? 
No, no, this is, this is uh, purely, oh, I forgot to say, this is purely a model. This is Wave Watch 3 model, where you compute the wave propagating everywhere in the ocean using as an input the wind and pressure gauge measurement in some places. And out of these uh, waves coming from all directions, you take only those who come from opposite direction and you keep the amplitude, the amplitude of the uh, two waves and the pressure, and this is how you get this. But where do you get the waves? Is it from the No, from boys. Because you, you cannot get such a high resolution. Mm. It's not so high a resolution. If you look in detail, there are many things that do not fit. But at, at global scale, it will extremely well. For example, this model works quite well when you have storms, but when you have a cyclone, you should have an even better uh, or more thin grid, and uh, it, it works less well. But still, it is already a very good model. So, that makes sense to try to invert globally. <laughs> I see why you want to go. <laughs> no, I think it is, I think it is worth. I, I think it is worth, but if you do it, you need to compare it with this, and you need to do it frequency dependent, because this is the key parameter. And uh, uh, oceanographers are very interested by having seismological data as input to improve their model. And for example, we, we have a partnership with IFREMER where we provide a spectrogram continuously spectrogram so that they can use it to try to improve their wave model. So the model is already great, but uh, there's a lot of room for improvement. We have even looked at work with uh, GPS scatterometry, so they use backscatter breaks from GPS to uh, estimate sea surface roughness. We work together with these guys to calculate or to... Yeah. yeah. Okay. May I ask another question? Uh, just one thing, the problem with satellites is that they're not, uh, uh, they're not that many measurements that are precise enough for this. But in some particular case, yes, it's good. Okay. Uh, one question, you talked about the, the building of the ellipse uh, and the raft data, but there was a blue ellipse with, uh, yeah. and the whole lot of things. Can you talk about this? What yes, because, uh, be? okay. Just because we wanted to find radio waves, this is the first reason. But uh, okay, the, on Earth you also have this, when you look at long period. And this is very well explained on Earth by uh, compliance and tilt, due to pressure. Just uh, yeah. when you have a station on a vault, whatever, you clearly see it, how it changes uh, when the wave front is passing. The purpose that we had was that uh, we started being sure that what we would record would be immediately seismic waves. And it happened that it was not so trivial. Well, I was just wondering on the generation of the noise, mainly controlled by the wind from Mars. Is that actually the interaction with the topography on Mars? Or is that like a local effect of the pressure system itself? By solar panel, you mean? Sorry. No, like the, the seismic generated or the seismic noise on Mars. Is that generated by the wind interacting with the topography on Mars? Or actually like by the pressure of the local drop? We still water? don't fully know. Uh, my feeling, okay, you, you have both. My feeling is that they, they, are, they are still, but we don't know where and how. Because you have pressure fluctuation, you have lots of activity in the atmosphere. And uh, if you have activity in the atmosphere, it's just like you push the ground. And when you push the ground, it's like a vertical force, and then you will have seismic wave propagating. And this is what we thought we would record. We, we thought, okay, there's such a strong activity in the atmosphere, we will for sure, even if they are small, we would record uh, seismic waves. But from this type of mechanism, what we will, should record most is radio wave, and we did not observe them. So maybe just because they are hidden by, uh, by other, other by wind, local wind, and things like this. But in one explanation, also like strong wind system pushing against the mountain, let's say, like the topography is then exciting seismic waves, like mm -hmm. waves on Earth in the ocean against the shore. Mm -hmm. like yeah, they are. Yeah. But there will be coming papers on this kind of topic.
not for me, for me, but. Uh, Mm -hmm. I have a question what the what the break rate of the first year is on Earth. Are you comparing the data to the model rate? Uh, do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, <laughs> more or less. <laughs> you showed a, a slide with two pictures. There was a model rate of the data. Yeah, I think that was that. So below that, the model rate. Yeah. So how did you model that? Like, what went into the input? To consider either side effects or a side effect from turning into one particular station? Sorry? When you have when you model the spectrum class uh, below. Like, yes. Uh, what was the input of this model? What was the input of this model? How oh. did you calculate it? I mean, did you have a gradually selected uh, Earth model? Oh, yes. It was 1D Earth model, yes. Yes, 1D Earth model. Except, not fully, because we also took it, let's say, it was, it was a warm 2D Earth model in the sense that we took into account the, the thickness of the ocean beneath every, every station. Uh, sorry, be, beneath every source. So if you do it with, uh, normal with uh, summation of normal modes, for example, you can compute the eigenfunction at the source location, the eigenfunction at the receiver location, and okay, you have in the equation, it will be the product of the two eigenfunctions. So you can compute the eigenfunction for a model where you have a given thickness of ocean and uh, take another one at the, at the receiver. And, uh, and that's how you can take varying source uh, varying model beneath its source. And this is, okay, in that case it was more empirical, but this is what we do. Yeah. 